Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation. This time on Colores. Kathy Flynn shares stories of discovering and saving New Mexico's WPA art treasures. It's just an amazing thing to, to see these things when you walk into a building and, and see them, the story they're telling. Edgar Degas was recognized as a great painter, but the other mediums he used reveal a deeper appreciation of the artist's work. In the early drawings, they're very precise, but in the late works of art, such as the beautiful monotype of the man and the woman, it's like a finger painting by a genius. Rebecca Eaton, executive producer of PBS's hit series Masterpiece, shares how she initially turned down Downton Abbey. I must be the luckiest woman in show business because <laughs> it went around the circle of other American television executives to co-produce and nobody picked it up. And I woke up and realized... What made you wake up? Maggie Smith. Simpsons animator Tim Decker pushes art students to reach their full potential. I want the students to feel their lines. I want them, when they feel the form, they should be able to draw the form. You're feeling the form with your pencil. It's all ahead on Colores. Kathy Flynn shares stories of discovering WPA artworks lost over time. been unearthing not just historic pieces of New Mexican art, you've been unearthing New Mexico history. Well, how did these pieces go lost? Well, if some painting was hanging in somebody's office for 20 years and that person was, uh, goes out of office and he's closing out his office and he's taking everything home, some of those pieces have gone home with them too. Now, you can't very well take murals home, mm -hmm. but in some cases, the buildings have been torn down mm -hmm. and the, build, the artwork has been lost. It's either been destroyed, mm -hmm. or in one case we know of, it was an oil on canvas, and it was in a federal building in Roswell. The building was torn down. Everybody thought it was lost or just destroyed. Ironically, some years later, uh, a judge found it in the basement of the federal courthouse at 421 Gold mm -hmm. and said, I want that in my courtroom. Did he know what he was looking at or did he just like I, I think he just loved, he just loved the subject. It's yeah. called Justice Tempered with Mercy, Uphold the Right. It was done by Emil Bistrom from Taos. I can imagine a judge being down in the basement, but you also go and, and unearth these works of art. So what's that like? There's no central list, but I found some lists. So then I just started calling people or traveling to a site. I found that if you go to a place and ask for the employee that's been there the longest <laughs> and see if they remember it, sure. and there was one I've, I wasn't able to find, but at least I found out what happened to it. Uh, I found a woman in the cafeteria who'd worked there for years and I asked her, you know what happened to this painting? I don't have a picture of it. Oh yeah, I saw that in the dumpster. And I said, in the dumpster? Yeah, the frame broke, so they threw it out. He There's a, a lot of etchings that were done by Jean Kloss, all very unique to New Mexico. And those were distributed out to all the schools and some universities. There's uh, one still at the National Park Service building in Santa Fe. What you look for is there's a brass plaque down at the bottom that names the Public Works of Art Project and the year. I found one of those uh, somewhere in the north. The frame was there, but the etching is gone. And another guy did some, and his name was B.J.O. Nordfeld. He did lithographs, and uh, 
Those are the kinds that really kind of move, you know, get lost. There's one in the state capitol building now that was sold in a garage sale and somebody found it and gave it to me to put into the capitol building. And these are federal properties. They belong to us. Well, and this is why it's like treasure hunting, because you don't know what, people don't necessarily know what they're looking at. Del Rio Manuel no volvió. Sus amigos no lo han encontrado. Ay, pobre Manuel Antonio. One day, somebody came in and said, look, I just found this in a box in a closet. And I opened up the box. There was an oil painting by uh, Isla McAfee of buffaloes. And it had been taken out of the frame, out of the stretcher, and folded twice so that it was in four pieces hanging together just by strings. That was one of the very first things that our organization the National New Deal Preservation in the New Mexico chapter spent money to have that rewoven so that it was a solid piece again and restored and it is in the Albuquerque uh, city chambers. Can, can you tell us a story about the moment where you first uh, discovered the artwork at New Mexico Highlands? There are eight of them. They are over every door, interior and exterior door of the lobby at Illfield Auditorium and each one had a mural with a scroll in the center and the center had a quotation. Mm -hmm. Then the mural depicted that quotation, which also depicted the department of the university. So we were trying to find them. I had a picture that showed they existed. I took a conservator over there and we stood under the door jams of each one of those doors. And he said, there's canvas up there. There's paint on top of the mm -hmm. canvas. The end result, we found that there were mm -hmm. five and six coats of white paint covering all these murals. So when we then took another conservator over there to restore them, when we got a lot of money to pay for it, mm -hmm. they just carefully, wow. with chemicals, took all the paint off and the murals were there. Wow. And they are still there. <laughs> Un par de ojitos negros, cielito lindo de contrabando. Ay, 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 canta y no llore, porque cantando se alegra el cielito lindo de corazones. Una flecha en el aire. Why is it important to preserve these things? Because this is our legacy from the 30s and 40s, a time that was really difficult here in the state. We were part of that Dust Bowl era. People were struggling, the drought, it was awful. And there was no jobs. It's a time much worse than what we're in right now. So what made you say, I, I have to do this? I felt it was something that everybody needed to know about and look at and appreciate. It's just an amazing thing to, to see these things when you walk into a building and, and see them, the story they're telling. It's the history of a town or a county or the people or what they did. Como el hilo no se corte, yo a mi tierra volveré, yo a mi tierra volveré. We need more people to know because it's their story in many cases. It was their family members that participated in it. De mi querida patria me van a retirar. Edgar Degas, the private impressionist, illustrates the creative genius and the extraordinary world in which he lived.
when you find works of art by a particular artist that move you deeply, suddenly you realize that that artist is part of you. And that's what happened with me, with Degas. Somebody once said that you can learn how to paint in a day, it takes you 25 years to learn how to draw. And so everything comes out of drawing, not painting with Degas. And so my exhibition here that's based on his drawings and his etchings, which are a form of drawing, are very much into the wheelhouse of what he's about as an artist. There are his prints, there is drawings, there is one sculpture, there are monotypes, there are photographs. Along with works by Degas, there are also works by his contemporaries and friends that were friends of Degas, that Degas had wonderful interaction with, like Mary Cassatt and Toulouse-Lautrec and Paul Cezanne. Most people, when they hear the name Degas, they say, oh, he's the ballerina artist, or oh, yes, he does horse races. In many cases, people thought of him as a realist rather than an impressionist. I think that you can still put that title on him because his sense of realism captured the moment in the interaction between uh, two individuals, for instance, about a private life behind closed doors, so to speak. You see this also in his photographs, these beautiful, intimate photographs, and you see him uh, with his friends, such as his younger brother, René, and uh, the great composers Claude Debussy and uh, Ernest Chasson. Degas had a wide circle of friends, not just in the arts, but also in writers and in musicians and composers of the day. Robert Flynn Johnson has been collecting these lesser-known Degas works since 1973. And he says in that time, he's developed a deeper appreciation for Degas' evolution as an artist. In the early drawings, they're very precise, but in the late works of art, such as the beautiful monotype of the man and the woman, it's like a finger painting by a genius. It's very loose and it's very rough and it's very confident. It's almost a sense where an artist starts off with the kind of meticulousness of Bach and ends up with the looseness and spontaneity of Theonis Monk. Degas was obviously out at a racetrack. He did one drawing, two drawings, three sketches on one side of the sheet. He turned the piece of paper over and did two more sketches on the back side. He didn't do them to put in a frame and to sell. He did them because he was trying to understand a certain aspect of that horse's anatomy that he would utilize when it came time to do one of his more finished racehorse pictures. They were a necessary form of Degas' creativity. There's 21 drawings by Degas in the exhibition. Not one of those drawings ever was on the art market before his death. They all stayed in his studio till the end of his life. He was a prolific printmaker, but most printmakers make prints to sell to the public in multiple editions. He didn't. He did prints and he put them back in his portfolio. With more than 100 works in his collection, Johnson doesn't hesitate when asked why he bought that first one 40 years ago. He says there was something about the tiny work that moved him in a big way. When I bought that first small monotype of Two Little Trees in 1973, I had no idea that it would grow into a collection like this. I'm a custodian. I am lucky enough to be able to have these works of art as part of my life, hanging in my home when they're not in an exhibition like this. His works had a psychological intensity that really interested me. Executive producer Rebecca Eaton shares behind-the-scenes stories from the long-running hit series Masterpiece. And with me now is Rebecca Eaton, executive producer of Masterpiece. Rebecca, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Let me start where you start your book, your confession that yes, initially you truth. turned down. Yes, I did. Downton Abbey when was for that What? I, I did feel the need. I had to tell the truth. Yes, <laughs> I did turn it down. Uh, they called me, they said, we have this really interesting show, an aristocratic family, beautiful country estate, marriageable young girls, money, life, death. And I said, it sounds good, but we're about to do the new upstairs, downstairs. We had a very full plate, maybe not. And uh, I must be the luckiest woman in show business because <laughs> it went around the circle of other American television executives to co-produce and nobody picked it up. And I woke up and realized... What made what, you wake up? Maggie Smith. Oh. I heard Maggie Smith had been cast. She's one of my very, very favorite actresses. And Elizabeth McGovern, who plays Cora, mm -hmm. called and said she had just been at the table read, the, the read through, the whole cast gets together. And she said, this is, this is going to be really special. So I picked up the phone and called and said, is it still available? And, but I still didn't know it was going to be the phenomenon it is. Anybody who reads your book will know that you were born 
to be the executive producer of Masterpiece Theater, but you really didn't want the job at the no, beginning. No, I didn't want the Explain job. Explain that. Uh, you know the John Le Carre book, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold? Yeah. I thought I was a producer then. I was making documentaries. I had just worked on a feature film. And I thought to do Masterpiece, to be the executive producer of Masterpiece, was a desk job. It wasn't really making anything. How was it different than what you expected? Well, I thought it would be easy, first of all, <laughs> because these brilliant productions are made in England. Right. They are not produced here in the States. They're made at the BBC, the independent companies. So I thought my job would be just watching television all day and say, I'll take that one, I won't take that yeah. one, I'll take that one which is kind of how it was in the beginning when Masterpiece was born, Masterpiece Theater, as it was then in 1971. My predecessor would go to London and watch the tapes of these shows till her eyeballs were spinning mm -hmm. freely in her head. And as soon as I took the job, Masterpiece was 15 years old and almost immediately, this is the year after The Jewel in the Crown, things changed drastically. The British started needing partners to really co-produce, so they needed people to take the risk with them, to come in before the shows were made, to come in on the basis of scripts or ideas or just pitches. So I had to start working a little harder that way to, you know, t you know, really, really understand what a what it takes. So determining to get, what would be produced. Yeah, yeah, and what would make it from the page to the stage, right. as the saying goes. Then the other thing that got harder is that mobile who had underwritten Masterpieces in 1971 to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars, wow. withdrew. Wow. Exxon mo bought mobile, and then we lost the funders. So all of a sudden, we had much less money. PBS did support us through those thin times. Uh, we had to take more risks, and the British stopped making as many costume dramas, right. frock dramas. And so the pipeline sort of dried up. Um, and it got kind of tough. Well, let me do as you do in your book, come back to Downton Abbey. What's the secret of that program? What's the secret to it? If I knew the <laughs> secret to it, I would not tell you on <laughs> television. Uh, I think none of us know. We all have our theories. Um, it might have to do with the times that we live in. Times are tough, times are hard. It looked like in those times, even though they were tough, World War I, you know, the Titanic going down, that these people were enduring, prevailing, and they were in this house, in this beautiful country house. They are a community that supports each other and sees each other through. And I think it's very good-hearted. My particular theory is it's very good-hearted, but let's not forget the frocks and the beautiful young people, the actors, uh, the, who play the younger people, and the, the solid gold senior British stars like Maggie Smith and Penelope Wilton and Hugh Bonneville, Jim Carter, who play the the older people. So you have a favorite character? I do. Tell us what I, I shouldn't. Come on. I'll just tell you, but it I won't me, yeah, tell, yeah. tell them. <laughs> um, my two favorites are, uh, I have to say, Sophie McShera, who plays Daisy. Interesting. And Rob James Collier, who plays Evil Thomas. And who's going to die on the show this season? Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you really want me to lose my job, apparently. Um, okay, I guess you I, I can't possibly comment. So finally, Rebecca, why did you write uh, this book? Was it your swan song? Are you bidding farewell to Masterpiece you know, and to the rest I of us? I thought I was. I had been doing this show for 27 years, and Masterpiece was 42 years old. And they asked me to write a personal memoir, a working woman, you know, at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, raising a family, how do you do that being a woman executive? And they wanted me to write Masterpieces memoir, and I really didn't want to do it. I wasn't <laughs> comfortable stepping out in front of the curtain, but as I started to write it and interview Kenneth Branagh, Eileen Atkins, Daniel Radcliffe, and remember how much I love these people, how much I love this programming, and how much the show, Masterpiece, has meant to so many families, uh, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I have the best job in television. Yeah. Why, why would I retire? Why would I? So I am, I'm completely back in the saddle as yeah. a result of that. That's writing. good news. That's good news. Well, oh, Rebecca, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ralph. Simpsons animator Tim Decker teaches young artists the importance of line and movement.
Remember, try to get the feet and the hands in there, even if you're just putting in a little slot there. Just something to annotate that there's a foot and a hand. Let's get drawn. Tim Decker Let's watches over this digital life drawing class. The class is part of the animation program at the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Decker offers classical instruction in a new age format. It's less messy. Once they do their digital drawings, they can transport them onto anything, they can print them on anything, they can do anything. Whereas in the old days, if you were drawing on paper, it would be going through reams and reams, sketchbook after sketchbook. And a lot of these drawings, you know, forgive me for saying, but are just quick studies. They're not fine art, they're not anything. So there's a lot of paper that was wasted before. But it's different because they don't feel the paper. You know, you'll, you'll hear artists say that, I can feel the paper, I can feel the difference. But they get used to feeling the screen now, but they don't have that texture of the paper. That's one of the main differences I think the students encounter here. I have gotten used to it. Um, this is probably my uh, third semester of being on these pretty frequently. But it's definitely, it's way better than just paper. It's like, like Tim was saying, like it saves paper. Your hands only get messy from your own hands dragging on the screen. But it's, it's really awesome. Like, and it, it's, you know, when you have like a different, like a Wacom tablet that is not the monitor, then it, you kind of, you just lose something. You know what I mean? You just have a disconnection to that. But this you can just, you don't like it, throw it away, change it. You, you can undo, you can't undo in real life. <laughs> Decker has his class firmly rooted in the fundamental principles of the animation arts. He blends the practical, the theoretical, and the creative, and that gives his students a competitive edge. I have the students drawing in a grip that we learned in one of my life drawing classes, and it's basically what I'm forcing them to do is to draw from the shoulder, and that's classical training. You need to draw from the shoulder because all the movement is fluid from the shoulder. When you draw from the wrist, you get kind of like a, you know, like a little. You don't get the fluidity of the line. Mm -hmm. The line's not as smooth and it doesn't have the movement. So when you go to the grip, you get a smooth flowing line, not a broken little scratching, called chicken scratch. And I really don't want that. I want the students to feel their lines. I want them, when they feel the form, they should be able to draw the form. You're feeling the form with your pencil. Today we're doing 30 second drawings, they're warming up, and their first warm up is when they first come in, I want them to sit and draw circles, just to loosen up their shoulder muscles. And then we go into 30 second drawings, which they basically capture in 30 seconds. They should capture, there's your line of action. And they should be able to get a quick gesture down of what's happening with the character, with the model. And by doing that in about 30 seconds, I think that is. That's really all I'm looking for. That's really just a quick gesture, just a quick movement of the character. It's basically making them break down the character, break down the model, if you will, to shapes. And once they get the shapes down, they'll get the movement. And then the next session they'll go three minutes and then we might work into five minute poses later on today. The purpose of the drill is to teach shape and form and volume. To get the character down, to tell a story with your sketch, and now that the model moves in sequential order, okay. they're breaking down animation and breaking down movement in their minds. And you know, a lot of them are like, well this is kind of boring, she just moved this. But you're really breaking down the animated movement. So later on when you're animating, you can say, how does, how does somebody throw a punch? There's a punch being thrown. And so they'll be able to remember how they drew that in sequential order. That'll only help their animation. Decker is a seasoned professional. He worked as an animator for the Simpsons TV show and was animation supervisor for Disney Interactive. These here are sample portfolio pieces from a Disney portfolio. These are quick sketches. These are the same, same thing we're doing here, three minute drawings. And I think some of my students have, are getting pretty close here. Over here is my students, over here are the portfolios for Disney. So you can see my students are pretty close to getting there, if not there. I mean, we have very talented students. The film and game industries aren't what they used to be. The world is changing and changing fast. And Tim Decker is providing the talent and resources 
to not only keep up, but to raise the visual bar to new levels. You know, METC offers a lot of great valued programs here. And, you know, as a matter of fact, today I was talking to two universities that want to become part of METC, to use the technologies that we have here because we're so forward thinking. We were the first school in the Midwest, I know, if not the United States, to do digital life drama. We've been doing it now, this is our sixth year. So we were one of the first to be doing it. And Wacom, who make the Cintiq tablets, said, nobody's ever done this before. This is awesome that you're attempting this and doing this. So I really think that's you know, a nice feather in METC's cap for being forward thinking and staying up with technologies and being green. <laughs> Next time on Colores. Using ice books and other metaphors, eco-artist Baja Erland wants everyone to understand the complex issues of climate and ecological disruption. It's a kind of knowledge that I hope people will understand about the importance of fresh water. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD has long been an inspiration to artists. Pompeii really goes into artists' minds in a much deeper and more complicated way. Photographer and visual artist Lynn Parks gravitates to stark urbanscapes. The things I'm drawn to tend to be decayed, patched together. They become a metaphor for my own personal experience with um, a rare disease that I've had since I was a child. Seeing through a high-powered microscope, Karen Gustafson creates fantastic ink drawings of fruits and vegetables. By looking at the microscope, you're seeing the topography. So it really becomes its own landscape at that point, and just the complexity and the intricacies that you find are just amazing. Until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>